Life is fragile. It's a fact we're learning in real time, every day. What we once called normal has seemingly disappeared. There's uncertainty in the air, restlessness in our hearts. Things we once took for granted are becoming difficult to find. Our usual day-to-day -day has evolved into this odd chaos. Peace is becoming obsolete. Many have lost jobs, security, and those they love. The pain is undeniable. But what if our fragility caused us to lean harder into God? What if, in our weakness, we chose to rely more on His strength? Would our outlook change? Would the peace that passes understanding begin to drown out the noise of this moment? Would we walk in a quiet confidence, knowing our God is mighty to save? We're not promised tomorrow, but we are given a simple truth to stand on. Our God goes before us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Yes, life is fragile. But in our weakness, He is strong.
lives of hope and service. We want to serve God, but sometimes life is to be too difficult for us. Place your trust in God's power and love. God understands our needs, our sorrows, and our joys. Come, let us worship God who is with us always. Praise God for God's eternal presence. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, Lord you have called us here this day for healing, hope, and transformation. As we listen to the scripture, pray our prayers, sing our hymns, and hear the words of wisdom, open our hearts to hear your claim on our lives, that we may fully and joyfully serve you. Amen. Struggling with their health. 
whether they're in the hospital, whether they're at home. We pray, Lord, for your mercy, and we pray, God, for your grace. Dear God, we lift up this community of Taylor and the surrounding areas. We know that people are struggling with many of life's struggles and afflictions. And we pray for those who are sick. And we pray for those who are lost. And we pray for those who are searching. We pray, God, for those who do not have a home, who do not have food, and for those who do not have a family. We pray, Lord, for all of your people, for wherever they may be. We lift up, Lord, the people who are listed on our prayer list, the people who are listed within our hearts and minds. We lift them up to you. And we pray, God, for all people all across your world. For this we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Then in my flesh I shall see God. 
whom I see on my side, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. If you say, how, will, how we will persecute him, and the root of the matter is found in him, be afraid of the sword, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, so that you may know there is a judgment. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious God, we give you thanks that you continue to speak to us this day. We give you thanks, God, for the message in the book of Job. Now help us, Lord, to have an open heart, an open mind, open ears to hear your voice and to hear your call on our lives. For this we pray in Jesus' name, who is our rock and redeemer. Amen. There's a song that I have always loved for a long time. And I loved it even more when I was in seminary. And then I loved it even more when I came to understand that the song is based on the book of Job. And the song is called, My Redeemer Lives. And this particular version of My Redeemer Lives is sung by Nicole Mullen. And I don't know if y'all have heard of her, uh, but she sings uh, that version of My Redeemer Lives. Now, there are other versions of that song or a song that is based on the book of Job that My Redeemer Lives. And I was actually looking at this week, searching for a version for us to sing it today because it would have gone great with my message and with the book of Job. But I couldn't find a version, not in our Methodist hymnal, not in the faith we sing, not even in the Coke spirit. But I did discover that Charles Wesley did write a hymn called My Redeemer Lives the only problem is that it's not in our United Methodist hymnal, but it is in the Lutheran hymnal, so go figure that. But it is also in the African Episcopal Methodist hymnal. The song that we will finish up with today is also talking about that our Redeemer lives, because he lives. That is the song that we're going to finish up our message with today and so but since we're not singing the song that i'm talking about by nicole bullen i thought that i would just go ahead and share the lyrics of that song with you because the message in the song is not only based on the book of job but it, it is also very powerful who taught the sun where you stand in the morning. And who told the ocean you can only come this far? And who showed the moon where to hide till evening? Whose words alone can catch a falling star? Well, I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. All of creation testifies this life within me cries. I know my Redeemer lives, the very same God that spins things in orbit, runs to the weary, the worn, and the weak. And the same gentle hands that holds me when I'm broken, they conquer death to bring me victory. Now I know my Redeemer lives. Let all creation testify. Let this life within me cry, I know my Redeemer lives. He lives to take away my shame, and he lives forever, I'll proclaim. That the payment for my sin was the precious life he gave, but now he's alive and there's an empty grave. And I know my Redeemer lives, I know that my Redeemer lives let all creation testify. Let this life within me cry. I know my Redeemer lives. Of course, there are other versions of this message from the book of Job, 
that my Redeemer lives, that Handel's Messiah also included my Redeemer live in his masterpiece of the Messiah. But Handel also concluded his masterpiece by stating that Christ the Redeemer lives, that Christ is risen from the dead. There are other versions, of course, of this hymn by other groups written in other hymnals. But no matter the group, no matter what person sings a version of this song, the question for us today, do you know that your Redeemer lives? Do you really know and do you really believe that your Redeemer lives? Because no matter what it is that we may, may be facing in life, that no matter what it may be that we're struggling with in life, Job's message for us this morning is that our Redeemer lives and that he will stand upon the earth and that he will see his God face to face. And that is a powerful testimony that regardless of what it is that we may be facing in life, whether we're facing it today or whether we will be facing it tomorrow, we stand and we hold on to hope because there is a Redeemer. There is a God who is our rock and our Redeemer. If you were here last week, then you would have heard at the beginning of the story from the book of Job. There was a conversation that took place between God and Satan. Job was indeed living the good life. He had it all. He had money, he had power, he had servants. He had had it all. And he even had faith in God. There was no one else on the earth that was like him. Then one day, it took one day for him to lose it all. Lost all his possessions, lost all his workers, lost all his family, lost 10 of his children. And when his wife said, let's just give up, let's just throw in the towel, let's just go ahead and curse God and die, it would be better for you to die, Job said, no, not me. He tore his robe open, he shaved his head, and he kneeled down on the ground and worshiped the Lord. And Job's message to his wife was that the Lord gives it, and the Lord is the one who takes it. Must we only take the good from the hands of God and not also accept the bad? Job's message was that there is a living God who will redeem him one day. Job insisted that you must trust God, even in our worst days. Our passage today continues, and we're actually in the middle of a dispute between Job and his friends, his friends Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. They heard about what Job was going through. He, they heard about the losses that Job was struggling with, I mean, he lost his, all of his children. He lost all of his possessions. So the friends travel. They come to Job to comfort him. And for a whole week, nothing happened. They didn't say a word. They were there with Job, comforting him even in the dust. And then after one week, Things got a little crazy. Let that be a message for us. If you invite friends to come over, don't let them stay for over a week. Because you, <laughs> you know what's going to happen. You got friends or family come over, don't let them stay beyond seven days. But the friends, after seven days, they started asking Job questions. They wanted to know what happened. They wanted to know how the events 
could have been prevented, they were certain that Job had done something wrong. And here's another lesson for us. Don't judge before you get to know the full story. Because Job's friends didn't know there was a conversation that took place in the beginning of the story, but neither did Job. They didn't know that Satan was the one that had inflicted the pain and the losses on Job. This is like us, for example, watching a 30 second video on TV and making a judgment call. When we don't really know the full story, when we don't really know the context of the story. I mean, we can't help it but to make a judgment based on what we see. But the truth is, we don't know the full story of what happened before, what happened after. I mean, we're talking about the age of technology where all videos can be edited. Well, I can edit our videos to say whatever I wanted to say. I mean, it is that scary. But, but that's like Job's friends who insisted that Job must have done something wrong for him to have suffered so greatly. But Job here argued for his innocence. He argued his case, and he claimed to his friends that he didn't do anything wrong. There was nothing that he did. He went through, and he was thinking it through, probably staying up all night, thinking, what could I have possibly done wrong to have deserved this? His friends became his persecutors. Job pleaded with them to give him a break. Then Job started getting upset at God. He started to accuse God that surely God must have been the one who inflicted his pain. That God must have been the one who caused all of his misery. And that it was God and that God was not being fair. He was not playing fair. He even wished that he was never born. You can't help but feel the pain that Job was experiencing. You can't help but to feel the misery that Job was feeling. Maybe some of you have experienced such pain, such heartache, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching online. In the end of this chapter, after arguments and after rebuttals, Job declares his faith that although he may have lost it all, he will not lose his faith in God. He has a redeemer who will rescue him from his misery, from the mess that he is in. His redeemer lives and will indeed stand on the last day. The book of Job here is not necessarily a historical account, but rather it is a reflection on the problems of human suffering. The suffering particularly of the innocent, the prosperity of the wicked, and the place of God in all of this. Job raises the series of questions of who do we understand God to be and God's role in this world. Job helps us to ask questions, and we continue to ask questions whenever there is a humanitarian crisis. We continue to ask questions whenever there is a tragedy. We continue to ask questions whenever there is a crisis somewhere that someone, some people, undeservingly are suffering. Imagine, though, if you never struggled in life. Imagine if you were only living the good life and you never had to struggle one day in your life. What kind of questions would you be asking? 
Certainly, you would not be asking the questions that Job is asking. Because you can't ask the questions of suffering, of true suffering, if you've never felt the pain yourself. You can't ask or understand the suffering of someone else unless you too have gone through the pain, the suffering, and the loss. We would certainly have a different perspective on suffering if we never suffered ourselves. Yesterday, one of the news headlines that came across my phone was about a woman in Colombia who was going to become the first person in that country to be euthanized, that did not have a terminal illness. And the story captured my attention and I read the story and perhaps you got the news alert as well, it made world news because she would become the first person out of that country, majority are main, mainly Catholics, Roman Catholic, and she would become the first person in that country to be euthanized even though she's not terminally ill. She is suffering, however, from ALS. And her, her response as she was getting interviewed by these national or international newspapers her response was that God did not want to see her suffer. I read her, her comments and the story, and I couldn't help but agree with her theology, but I struggled with her decision. Her church, the Catholic Church, also struggled with her decision. We don't want to see anybody suffering. God doesn't want any of us to suffer. But our decision, our decision of life is on life is a struggle itself. She was scheduled to die this morning. But apparently there was a medical team, I don't know if you read up or follow up on the story, a medical team made a decision on the 11th hour and halted the procedure. They said she no longer qualified to be euthanized. But as I read this story, and others like it, because I'm sure you have read other stories similar to this one, I was reminded of Job. I was reminded of Job and his losses, of his suffering. I mean, the guy had lost it all. Not only that, he lost his health. He had boils all around him that I'm certain were very painful. I'm certain that he too asked the question, is there a better option? Is there a better option out of this suffering that I'm currently experiencing? Certainly, he must have thought about what his wife had encouraged him to do, that it was better for him to just curse God and die. I don't know if any of you have ever been put in a situation where you had to make the final decision to pull the plug on someone that you love. Because the doctors have informed you that there's no way back to life. And you have to make that final call. It is a very difficult decision. It's an ethical decision, it's a moral decision, and it is a theological decision that you must make. It is a struggle. Here in this woman's case in Colombia, you have the state, you have the medical community, you have the individual and you have the family all making a decision on how to end life. For Job, in our story for today, 
He believed that there were better days ahead, for he knew so firmly that his Redeemer lives. With all the pain and the suffering that Job was enduring, the, the pain that he was experiencing, Job held on to his faith, even though in his darkest moment, even though he could not see God, Job believed that God could see him. And that's what mattered to Job. He knew that God was there. He knew that his Redeemer lived. He knew that his Redeemer was alive and well, and that his Redeemer would come to rescue him from the misery, from the misery, from the pain, from the suffering that he was experiencing. This was Job's testimony to his friends. He may have been beat down, but he didn't want to be counted out. He may have been broken, but the pieces were being held in God's hands. He may have been in pain and suffering, but he knew that his Redeemer lived. And he knew that his Redeemer would make a way for him that he would be able to face God in the end. Church, let this be an encouraging word for you, for whatever it is that you are facing today, and whatever it may be that you may be facing tomorrow, hold on to hope, hold on to your rock, Hold on to your Redeemer because that's the only thing that we have to hold on to. We may lose our families. We may lose all possessions in life. We may even lose our health. But like Job, he knew that his Redeemer lives. So hold on to that rock because that's the only thing that we have left. And know in your heart that God lives. And because God lives, we too shall live. Amen. Amen.